divide and rule it worked at every point of time Correct. you're saying right it worked when uh, in the wahhabi and the dehlvi period it worked during colonial period now explain this to me so the first thing that i have tried to show through the book which i hope people have latched on to is all the wahhabis were sufis shah wulullah dehlvi was a sanat carrying sufi which means he was ordained as a sufi into the sufi order his father was a sufi ahmed sir hindi was a sufi a lot of people who led people into riots in bengal were sufis proper riots and effectively this missionary arm of this particular mindset has played a huge role both in softening as well as wielding the stick as well as the sword that much is very clear from the documents so it's very difficult for me to buy this bollywood presented uh, invention that when you think of sufi think of these dervishes with the long hats and the long robes just swirling around constantly in ecstasy sorry <laughs> history is much more than this people swelling and and it's very difficult the blood bath that they've caused is astounding so all these people who led the wahhabi movement were sufis let's be clear about that that's mm-hmm. one second what am i trying to say i am not denying the fact that the british indulged in the divide and rule policy my qualification is it's not divide and the rule policy it's exploit the divide and rule the policy yeah exactly what i was trying to get to right? is that what you were saying is that this division process had started long ago it has always existed yeah and therefore when the british realize that when there is a particular discard that can be used to their benefit to also prevent or let's say put some kind of a fetter on claims of a separate nation or a nationhood or asking asking for home rule what is the re- principle behind this the british was very comfortable providing autonomy to those communities or those colonies which could lay claim to the to the status of being a single nation and the definition of a nation is not what we understand it today the definition of a nation is either you're bound by a single language or religion or race or whatever it is there has to be something which is homogeneous across the board so therefore they said first of all hindus and muslims are not a single nation even within hindus you're not a single nation that's the extent of their argument it is around that period that radha kumar mukherjee and everybody starts writing to say why bharat as a civilization must be seen different from europe's definition of a nation so that's, that's a diff- in your first book that's that in my whole first thing, book yeah. right now when he senses an opportunity in the muslims of bengal and assam who are willing to help him create a separate muslim majority state or muslim majority province as a counterweight now i am asking myself this common bindi the common sari the rabindra sangeet or whatever sangeet existed before that all of that should have played a role hmm. we end up focusing too much on the softer cultural aspects without asking whether this has had the power to prevent a political tide when the chips are down and when a, when a crucial decision is to be taken have all these mattered i am saying it they haven't mattered this is peace time discussion this is the discussion of the affluent and air conditioned uh, atmospheres drinking wine saying oh this is the greatness of the composite culture of this country when it mattered it did not okay did it matter when operation searchlight was going on in 1971 no it did not no right okay let's assume for a moment uh, for those who don't know about operation searchlight and tikka khan please google it and read about it because it is the most horrific uh, incident uh you know that has happened in south asia which the world has ignored that genocide that happened then please google it and read about it because it's something that the western world completely forgot and bangladesh was not strong enough to talk about it and uh, the rest of the countries in, in in asia including india did not talk about it so do google and read about it sorry sai so let's go before 1971 if this cultural let's say impact was so strong you shouldn't have had an eastern pakistan hmm. but you did why do we forget that bangladesh was indeed east pakistan that means they decided to go ahead with that particular decision not withstanding the common linguistic affinities and what not they said uh, we are throwing our weight behind these set of people who subscribe to the two nation theory that's one after 1971 and after the creation of bangladesh has it seen greater protection for the hindu minority there in stark contrast the hindu population in bangladesh has come down sharply every day you hear instances of rapes forcible conversions atheist bloggers being killed so on and so forth so the bengali affinity or the bengali commonality isn't strong enough to prevail over the islamic identity let's be very clear about that their ummahood reigns supreme 
that is established by the partition at 1947. Did they say, we don't wish to live with Pakistan, we don't subscribe to the two-nation theory, we'd like to merge back with Bharat in 1971? That's not their decision. That's not the decision post-1971. In fact, one of the ambassadors, I remember reading this as a school-going uh, kid, effectively told this to Bharat, do you expect us to be uh, grateful to you for eternity for 1971? This was the tone of Bangladesh in late 90s and early 2000s. When it was not the Bangladesh of even today, which has some kind of an economy to speak of. But why do we expect gratitude? We don't Isn't, expect gratitude. Yeah. We are asking for decent treatment of Hindu minorities there. Mm. We are asking for some kind of restraint on illegal migration. We are asking for some kind of uh, restraint on the export of cows from here in an illegal fashion at the cow slaughter that happens at Bharat's expense. Because Pashudhan may not matter to you and me, but it matters to the farmer. We have recently seen about 10,000 cows being repatriated from that particular part. And that border is so porous. In fact, there's a specific paragraph where I say that the infiltration into Assam has to be traced to the partition of Bengal and the antecedents of the two-nation theory start from 1905 at the very least, which directly is traceable to what is happening in Assam at this point. So, when we look at Assam, so I think in, in 2019, just before the lockdown, at the fag end of the year, Professor Faidan uh, Mustafa and I had a public debate hmm. on the NRC in Assam, whose results had just been announced. And uh, this debate was organized at Nalsar, of which he is the Vice-Chancellor. Now, I basically said, you want to look at NRC and Assam independent of the issue of Bangladeshi illegal migration. I'm sorry, enough literature says that's not possible. You need to look at it as a whole. Maybe 30% of the audience coughed at it. So in part, I'm responding to that. I'm saying, here's the literature. Deal with it. So when a country such as Bharat, as it exists today, is the product of multiple bloody vivisections, hmm. Why do we look at each of these instances in isolation without understanding what are the larger dots to be connected here? Perhaps that is the central thesis of the book. Please learn to connect the dots. Right. Uh, connect the dots when, when you talk about uh, that, you know, that Indian Muslims stayed on in uh, Pakistan, uh, stayed on in India, those who stayed on in India, pragmatism was a major reason. Right. Many times it was like there was no option. Correct. Right. To go. Um I had Asaduddin Owesi on the podcast recently and as you know, he's very uh, vocal about his identity as an Indian and as an Indian Muslim. Right. Uh, now, he said this and I quote it. He said, Main is mulk. reason I asked him also is because, you know, the people call him the modern day Jinnah in India. It's a, it's a very rude way of saying it. But then I think Jinnah was say, better. <laughs> okay. So they said that. So he says that I is mulk me is liye hoon kyunki mere buzurgon ne ye jinna ke two nation theory ko thukraya tha. So he talks about staying on in India that his parents did, his his ancestors did as a matter of choice, right. not as a as a pragmatic move because of financial reason or whatever. They were financially well off, his family. Right. So tell me about this, that why you have a different take on this. Well, the floodgates will open. So okay. I hope I will exercise my free speech to the fullest possible Absolutely, extent. Absolutely, please do. Right. So let's go to the first limb of your question, which is on... Why did I make the statement that they stayed back for reasons of practicality and pragmatism? Mm. The good part is, a lot of these people said this themselves. So there's a fantastic interview on YouTube of Maulana Madni, where he's speaking to a Pakistani journalist. And he was asked this very same question. Why didn't everyone move there? Mm. What was the reason? He said that the uh, you're looking at a population which has stayed in this part of the world for several generations. They had their properties here. And they had their masjids here. And most importantly, he alludes to something which is very crucial. Most people don't even talk about it. At the time of the discussion of Pakistan, even those Muslims who opposed the creation of Pakistan weren't doing so because they wanted to be part of Bharat, but because they believed that this entire land belongs to Islam. And therefore, they said, why are you settling for one third of this when the entire thing was supposed to be Mughalistan? So it's not that we belong to Bharat, but the converse is Bharat belongs to us. Hmm. Rather, Hindustan belongs to us. Because it had been conquered. Conquered. And that reference is constantly there in every speech of Sayyid Ahmed Khan where he said, we have ruled this place for 800 years. That's where this myth comes from, from his speeches. He says this over and over again. 
So when someone tells me, no, no, they stayed back for patriotic reasons, yes, but patriotism towards Bharat, no, patriotism towards Mughalistan. That is what they say. 